Good evening. I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Bright America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you, and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other, and with you, in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Jamal May, Michelle Whitaker, and Lindsay Adkins, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Birds Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you missed something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Birds Books hosts a reading by and conversation with Ken Oletta, George Howe Colt, and Susan Isaacs. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. A note about Crowdcast. Many of you have discovered the chat to the right of the page. Please feel free to comment throughout the evening. It's there for you. But if you do have a question for the authors, I go to the bottom of the page where that says, ask a question. And that's where you're to put your question for me to go find. Third item, the green link at the bottom of this page is to the episode that we are gonna be watching tonight. It is the website where you can buy the books written by these fine talents. Now a little about our first speaker. Ken Oletta has written for the New Yorker magazine since the late 70s. His 2001 profile of Ted Turner won a National Magazine Award as the best profile of the year. He is the author of 12 books, including five national bestsellers, Three Blind Mice, How the TV Networks Lost Their Way, Greed and Glory on Wall Street, The Fall of the House of Lehman, The Highwaymen, Warriors of the Information Superhighway, World War 3.0, Microsoft and its enemies, and Googled, The End of the World as We Know It, which was published in November of 2009. His 13th book, Hollywood Ending, Harvey Weinstein and the Culture of Silence, will be published in July of this year. In another life, Oletta taught and trained the Peace Corps volunteers, served as a special assistant to the U.S. Undersecretary of Commerce, worked in Senator Robert F. Kennedy's 1968 campaign for presidency, and was first executive director of the New York City Off-Track Betting Corporation. Please welcome to the screen, Ken Oletta. Alice, uh, I thought I'd read from the opening of my book, Googled, which came out in, in 2009. And it's a, it's a book about disruption, how the digital world disrupted the, the analog or the traditional media world in particular. And it begins um, with a scene, um, which I'll start reading. With his suit and tie and closely cropped gray hair, Mel Carmazan stood out as he crossed the Google campus in Mountain View, California. He saw people in baggy t-shirts holding their laptops before them like waiters trays. On the sunny June 2003 day, Google was neatly, nearly five years old and Carmazan was among the first major executives from the old media world to visit them. As the CEO of Viacom, he represented the world's then fourth largest media company, the owner of CBS, of TV and radio stations, Paramount Studio, MTV and assisted cable networks, Simon and Schuster Publishers, Blockbuster Video, and an outdoor advertising company. Short and pugnacious, Carmazan was by his own admission, always paranoid about competitors. Where the Google executives really got Carmazan's attention was when they described the company's advertising business. It was Google's ambition they told him, and they, meaning Eric Schmidt, the CEO, Larry Page, and Sergey Brin, the, the founders of, of Google. 
It was their ambition to provide an answer to the ad man's legendary line. I know half of my advertising works. I just don't know which half. To help them sort through the digital clicks, Google and other new media companies relied on what are called cookies, software files that reside on the user's browser and keep track of their activities, of their online search questions asked, web pages visited, time spent on each web page, advertisements clicked on, items purchased. Unlike traditional analog media companies, which can't measure the effectiveness of their advertising, Google offered each advertiser a free tool. It was called Google Analytics, and it allowed the advertisers to track day by day, hour by hour, the, member, the number of clicks and sales, the traffic produced by the keywords chosen, the conversion rate from click to sale, in sum, the overall effectiveness of an ad. Google took much of the guessing out of advertising. Quote, our business is highly measurable, Eric Schmidt said. We know that if you spend X dollars on ads, you'll get Y dollars in revenues per industry per customer. Carmazon was aghast. Most of the American media, television, radio, newspapers, magazines, depended for their existence on a long entrenched advertising model. In the old method at which Carmazon excelled, the ad sales force depended on emotion and mystery, not metrics. Quote, you buy a commercial on the Super Bowl, you're going to pay two and a half million dollars for the spot, Carmazon said. I have no idea if it's going to work. You pay your money, you take your chances. To turn this lucrative system over to a mechanized auction posed what he saw as a serious threat. I want a salesperson in the process, taking that buyer out for drinks, getting an order they shouldn't have gotten. What would happen if advertisers expected measured results from the two and a half million dollars spent for each 30 second spot in the Super Bowl, or for the approximately $60 billion spent on television advertising in the United States each year, or the estimated $172 billion spent in the United States on advertising, and the additional $227 billion spent on marketing. Quote, that's the worst kind of business model in the world, Carmazan said. The worst that is if you're an old school ad man. Quote, you don't want to have people know what works, Carmazan said. When you know what works or not, you tend to charge less money than when you have this aura and you're selling this mystique. For 60 years, network television sold much of its advertising in an upfront each spring and summer after the new fall shows were announced. Even as audiences were declining, executives created a cattle stampede mentality by convincing advertisers they could get shut out of the hit shows if they didn't buy early. Carmazan and the networks continue to charge ever steeper rates because he said, quote, advertisers don't know what works and what doesn't. That's a great model. The Google executives were equally appalled. They thought Carmazan's method manipulated emotions and cheated advertisers. Just as egregiously, it wasn't measurable and therefore was inefficient. They were convinced they could engineer a better system. By then, Carmazan knew there was little he and Google could do together. I was selling $25 billion worth of advertising, Carmazan said. Did I want someone to know what worked and what didn't work? Like the aging Falstaff, he had heard the chimes at midnight. Carmazan glared at the Google executives in the room. He folded his hands on the table. His cufflinks were gleaming. And he protested only half in jest and in a very loud voice, you're fucking with the magic. Thank you, Ken. Our second speaker is George Howe Colt. George Howe Colt is the best-selling author of The Big House, which was a National Book Award finalist and a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. Brothers, 
November of the Soul, and The Game. He lives in Western Massachusetts with his wife, writer Ann Fadiman. Please welcome to the screen, George Howe Colt. Let me find you here, George. Hi. You thank you, Alice. Uh, and thank you, Ken. I'm, I'm just in awe of your ability to, um, to write a character and convey lots of complex information. And it, I, I realized that until tonight, I had never understood what a cookie was. And now I know, thanks to you, that was, that was just wonderful. Thank you for that introduction, Alice. Uh, and thank you to Maestro Rosenblatt. I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be sharing the screen uh, later on with Ken and Susan. I'm gonna read tonight from my most recent book. It's about a football game that was played 54 years ago between Harvard and Yale. Uh, it, it was the final game of the year. Both teams were undefeated and both teams would finish the season undefeated too after Harvard in that game in a series of extraordinary plays and fortuitous bounces that the future New Yorker writer Hendrik Hertzberg would describe as the athletic equivalent of a multiple orgasm. Harvard scored 16 points in the final 42 seconds to tie Yale 29-29. Um, I, I wanted to write about that game, not because it was one of the most thrilling football games in college football history, but because of the context in which it was played. Uh, it was 1968, assassinations of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King, campus takeovers, urban unrest, and over everything, the war in Vietnam. I wanted to know how the players on the field that day had navigated that year, how they dealt with a host of social and political issues, most of which, of course, we're still dealing with in our country today. Um, on the field that day, there were uh, players who represented a really wide spectrum of viewpoints. Harvard had two members of SDS, Students for Democratic Society, the radical anti-war group, and several members of the ROTC, the Reserve Officers Training Corps. They had a Vietnam veteran as well as a conscientious, conscientious objector. Um, uh, so football may seem an odd choice for a uh, excerpt for Write, uh, Write America reading, but Write America is about bringing people together and writing, of course, can do that. But in some cases, I think that uh, football and sports can do that as well. So I'm gonna read the first few pages of the book, which opens with the first day of Harvard football practice. So imagine please that it's September 1st, 1968. When Pat Conway decided to play football again, the one thing he didn't want to do was embarrass himself on the field. And now he'd gone and embarrassed himself before he'd even gotten to the field. It was the first day of practice in the locker room, listening to the other players joking and laughing as they put on their uniforms. He had pulled on his football pants and drawn the laces tight, but something didn't feel quite right. He snuck a glance at the players nearby and realized what it was. He'd forgotten to put on his girdle the thick cloth wrap that contained pads for his backbone and hips. The girdle went on before the pants. He looked around sheepishly, worried that someone had noticed, but everybody was busy laking, lacing up their shoulder pads or pulling on their cleats. Conway took off his pants, cinched the girdle around his waist and pulled the pants back on. He felt like a fool. He'd forgotten how to put on a football uniform. Of the 117 candidates for the Harvard football team who reported on September 1st, 1968 for three weeks of preseason practice, Pat Conway was perhaps the most unlikely. He was 24 years old, six years older than some of his teammates. He hadn't played football in three years. He knew almost no one on the team. Six months ago, he'd been dodging mortar fire in Vietnam. Conway had played football for Harvard before, a high school All-American from Haverhill, Massachusetts. He'd arrived in the fall of 1963 and quickly established himself as a star halfback on the freshman team. On November 22nd of that year, after his 48-yard touchdown run gave Harvard the lead over Yale, he'd been standing on the goal line to receive the second half kickoff when the referee walked over and told him that President Kennedy had been shot. The hyper-competitive Conway pleaded with the official not to tell anyone else so they could finish the game. 
Sophomore year, Conway had started for the varsity, but he was floundering academically and Harvard put him on probation. The following autumn, falling still further behind, he left school, enlisted in the Marines, and was sent to Vietnam. While his Harvard teammates were playing Yale in November 1967, he had been digging foxholes at Quezon Combat Base, just south of the demilitarized zone. His tour almost up, he had reapplied to Harvard for the spring semester. But by the time his paperwork came through, more than 30,000 North Vietnamese troops had surrounded the 6,000 Marines at the base. It would be months before Conway was able to fly home. Conway hadn't expected to play football when he returned to Harvard for his senior year. But that summer, he'd gotten a letter from the coach saying he had a season of eligibility left. Did he want to rejoin the team? Conway said he'd give it a try. The last time he'd touched a football had been at Quezon, before all hell broke loose, before the NVA began shelling the base with a continuous barrage of artillery fire that made sleep almost impossible before a mortar round tossed him in the air and buried him upside down, before another hit just down the way in the trench and his face and arms were spattered with bits of warm flesh from a Marine who'd been less lucky, before it was rumored the NVA was going to launch an all-out attack and Conway couldn't stop shaking when he realized that all that lay between him and 30,000 enemy troops was a pile of sandbags, a bed of Claymore mines, and three strands of razor wire. Before all that, someone had come across a battered old football and Conway and a few other Marines had tossed it around for half an hour one afternoon. Conway would never see the ball again. He assumed it had blown up in a mortar attack. Conway had no real expectation of making the team, but ever since he'd started playing Pop Warner football in the seventh grade, fall had meant one thing, football. Returning to college after three years, away wouldn't be easy. Playing football might help him get back to his old life. Besides, Conway was lonely. He'd spent July and August in Cambridge going to summer school, living alone in a dorm in Harvard Yard. He was almost as old as some of his teachers. Everyone he'd been with at Harvard the first time around was off at graduate school or out in the real world. Going out for the team, he'd meet some people, and not just any people, his kind of people, blue collar guys, regular guys, guys who knew how to work hard. And if he didn't make the team, at least maybe he'd make a few friends. For most of the 116 other players who showed up that first day of practice, there was a comfortable back to school feel. They joshed and kidded, giving one another grief about a particularly colorful t-shirt or the length of someone's sideburns. Over dinner, they talked about their summers. It had been a strange, unsettling few months. The summer had seemed to begin on June 6th when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, only nine weeks after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Quarterback George Lalich and linebacker John Emery had been up late watching a movie in a Connecticut hotel room, preparing to play in the NCAA baseball tournament when the show was interrupted with news of the shooting. They stayed up all night watching the coverage and wondering what the country was coming to. The summer had ended with the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, which took place the week before football practice began. Offensive tackle Joe McGrath had been there, working as a congressional aide and staying in a hotel across from Grant Park, where the anti-war demonstrators gathered. One night, McGrath had been in the hotel basement, mimeographing the latest draft of the party platform, when a few dozen Chicago policemen, bloodied and furious after an encounter with rock-throwing protesters, came in to regroup. Another night, he'd walked out of the hotel and seen a mass of policemen lined up across from thousands of demonstrators who were shouting, oink, oink, and fascist pigs. Every so often, billy clubs flailing, the police charged into the crowd, which scattered into the park before regrouping and coming forward to renew its taunts at which point the police charged again, beating protesters, journalists, and bystanders alike. Between those disturbing events, the Harvard players had settled into their summer jobs. Many of them had worked in construction, which not only paid well, but helped them stay in shape. 
Lalich, the quarterback, had been a rod buster at a Chicago steel mill. Defensive back Mike Ananas had, loaded, un, had unloaded lumber at Boston rail yards. Not every player did heavy lifting. Guard Tommy Lee Jones had acted in a summer repertory theater at Harvard, playing the title role in a blues adaptation of the 15th century morality play, Everyman. Halfback Ray Hornblower had run with the Bulls at Pamplona before bumming around Spain. Defensive tackle Rick Byrne had driven across the country. It had been a mind-expanding trip from the deep south where his shaggy hair and New York license plates had earned him hard stares that Byrne would recall the following summer when he saw a movie called Easy Rider, to San Francisco, where Byrne had wandered among the flower children in Haight-Ashbury before ending up in Golden Gate Park in a vast swirl of barefoot, half-naked hippies smoking pot in broad daylight. That's a nice place to leave things. Thank you. Thank you, George. Our third guest is Susan Isaacs. Susan Isaacs is the author of 13 novels, including As Husbands Go, Long Time No See, Any Place I Hang My Hat, and Compromising Positions. A recipient of the Writers for Writers Award and the John Steinbeck Award, Isaac serves as chairman of the Board of Poets and Writers and is a past president of Mystery Writers of America. Her fiction has been translated into 30 languages. She lives on Long Island with her husband. Please welcome to the screen, Susan Isaacs. Well, good to be here. There you go. Hi, everybody. Um, Tonight, I'd like to read from um, my most recent novel, uh, Takes One to No One. Um, it's the first in a series. I'm now putting, uh, having finished the second, putting the final touches on it. Um, and uh, it should be published this year. And then they asked me to write a third, which, I'm delighted to do. <clears throat> this is from the first chapter. Um, and it's uh, the narrator is Corey Geller, um, a wife, mother, and a retired uh, FBI agent burned out after 10 years in anti-terrorism. And she's gone from uh, her native Queens. Of course, she went around the country. She's now living on Long Island, um, which is a very different life. I was early for lunch. Even if I dragged my feet, I'd be on time. True, I could stroll over to Manhasset Bay for maybe a couple of minutes and watch sunbeams exploding on the caps of the waves, inhale the aroma of washed up mussel shells. I'd be a little late for lunch, but at least I'd feel alive because right then I was numb with pre-boredom, knowing too well what the next hour and a half would bring. But then I heard my name shouted across the two lanes of Shorehaven's Main Street. Corey, Corey. Over here, a squawk as if one of the more clever gulls had mastered English. So even before I turned, I knew it was Phoebe Melowitz, eBay reseller with a 99.7 positive feedback. Ever on the lookout, her head swiveling right, left, right, she waited for a flatulent minivan, a rumbling fish delivery truck, and a top-down BMW its panache diminished by its driver, a guy older than Kaiser Wilhelm. I could have escaped Phoebe at my peak 12 years earlier when the Bureau transferred me from DC to New York to be part of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. I finished the marathon in four hours and 42 minutes, but she might take offense if I cut and ran particularly since we were both headed toward the same restaurant, the same table, actually. I read books are making a comeback, she screeched. Even close up, 
Phoebe always spoke too loudly, as if she expect, suspected all humanity had suffered a hearing loss. At the beginning, I figured she might be someone deaf herself and therefore unable to hear how ear-splitting her voice was. Then one Wednesday, I discovered she could pick up a whispered Wizard of Oz collectible plates across a crowded room. Phoebe clasped, clasped her raffia clutch bag to her narrow chest, apparently ready to be thrilled by whatever I said and added, find any new bestsellers? I freelanced for three large literary agencies, two in New York, one in London, scouting contemporary Arabic work, mostly fiction, that could succeed in the English-speaking market. Everyone in the group assumed that I'd been in publishing since graduating from college, a belief I knew not to correct. It's not as if, as if I were, was undercover or anything. It's just that when you're in the FBI doing counterterrorism for over a decade or doing contract work for them in the field, as I sometimes still did, you wanted to stay under the radar. No questions, no awkward answers. Phoebe might have persisted, but we reached the restaurant. Just as I was about to haul open the wood door, Pete Delaney, the packaging designer with a home office, came across Main Street from the parking lot. Pete's own packaging was unremarkable. Though he wore a nice enough long sleeve blue shirt with a teeny orange polo pony, his pants were strictly old guy, the baggy kind that make men look as if penises hadn't yet been invented. Afternoon, he greeted us. Pete's accent didn't say much about him, though no one would accuse him of coming from New York, which was fine because he had those pleasant middle-aged out-of-town manners. He pulled up in the heavy door of La Cuisine de la Sears and held it for us. However, a nanosecond after we were in, he quickly zigzagged around the tables, ensuring neither of us could get to his favorite seat. Phoebe chose a chair on the opposite side of the round table, so I sat to the right of Pete. After 15 minutes, the last two of the suburban seven drifted in. Marceline, who had cornered the market in writing speeches for Long Island Republicans, running for lesser offices. Darby, the freelance retoucher who had once worked for people. I didn't really belong. Actually, I should have realized that truth two years and seven months earlier when I was spurred to action by a short piece in the Shorehaven Sentinel. Freelancers enjoy lunch, seek new members. It was about residents with home offices who got together once a week but I was new to the suburbs and lonely. Each Wednesday, we followed the same format. 15 minutes of free range chit chat, the ritual passing around of cell phone photos to certify a happy life, pics of the kids with some piece of sports equipment, the new outdoor pizza oven, Posey the kitten inside what I hoped was an, an empty Cheerios box. Even though I grew up just 15 miles west of Shorehaven in Queens, this gotta be happy mindset was foreign to me. We of the five boroughs didn't tend to pass around snapshots of Aunt Minnie and hospice care, but we weren't so concerned about showing our neighbors all was well, or at least quasi well. Neighborliness was a terse exchange about weather. Anyway, after we ordered one of us, we went in week, weekly rotation, would speak about what was going on in his, her business life. We called it show and tell. That week it was Lucy Winter's turn. She came prepared with bar graphs and pie charts to illustrate what was happening data mining wise. So I found this amazing sequential pattern for one of my clients, she began. She held up one of her charts but as her seat was on the other side of me, I would have had to risk leaning forward and dipping my left nipple into the soup à l'oignon to observe the data. It wasn't possible to, to tune her out completely, 
but as in the last couple of weeks, I found myself diverted, checking out Pete Delaney, the guy on my other side. Pretty thorough checkout. I had the ability to look at people without seeming to look. My dad had been a New York City cop, a detective. So either it was in my DNA or picked it, or I picked it up from him as a kid. But this was my first time I got within inches of Pete, seated beside him. Not that there was anything immediate, and not that there was any immediately riveting finding unless you counted the liver spots on his right temple, though maybe they were three-dimensional freckles. Dots in a longer thing. They were arranged like five stars in a crescent, kind of what you'd expect on the flag of some small country bordering on Russia. And wait till you hear this, Lucy Winters was saying. She tapped her chart with one of her long, aqua-polished nails. I barely heard the rest because I didn't want to. I was occupied with wondering why Pete always seemed compelled to be the first one to arrive. All right, he was one of those people who believe it's, it's always better to get someplace early, especially when he had to grab a certain seat at the restaurant's one large table. It wasn't a Tony Soprano-esque maneuver. Pete's chair was directly across from the window. True, there was a thin strip of bay visible, but nine-tenths of what you saw through the glass was the municipal parking lot uh, diagonally across from Maine. Pete seemed far more engaged than I in listening to tales of the self-employed as well as sharing his own experiences. He acted like part of the group. Still, as I observed, his eyes always returned to one spot in the parking lot, wherever his car happened to be. Weird. So along with onion soup and a small salad, lunch became me watching Pete Delaney watching his high-end Jeep. I wondered, what's with him? Was he so fearful of somebody backing into his Rear bumper, sure it was a risk, but it was a risk everyone took. Plus it wasn't a Maserati. What was he worried about? The thought of a dead body in the back of his Jeep amused me for a moment, but I had to admit it was unlikely since there'd be a new body every Wednesday and the same old corpse would be naturally putrid enough to attract attention. Diamonds didn't go with Jeeps. Drugs? By this time, I was down to the sludge of barely remembered observations. Pete kept getting new cell phones. For a small, supposedly informal gathering, the lunch group had a lot of rules, including one that had us turning off our mobile phones and putting them on the table. Okay, a few years earlier, drug dealers were switching phones all the time, a lot more often than Pete did. Now, a lot of them were using a burner app or encryption. Besides, if Pete was trying to hide the fact that he got new phones, he'd simply bring the same old one every week. Probably I was spending too much time these days in make-believe worlds. I covered 10 to 15 novels a month and sent reports to the literary agencies I worked for. An excess of fiction could make reality seem supremely dull with its lack of nuance and crappy dialogue. It could lead to an unfulfilled longing for scintillation. Compared to the six other suburbanites at the Wednesday table, I probably was the one who was a teeny unmoored, creating an intriguing backstory for Pete where none existed. Except maybe Pete also had a bit of a secret life. Maybe it takes one to know one. Well done. Thank and you, so all of you. I'm wondering what happened to Conway. Oh, Pat. Um, yeah, well, he... he um, he came back and he played that year. He actually, uh, you know, played in 1968 and was first team all Ivy and was one of the best players on the Harvard team playing a position that he'd never played before. 
because the captain played at the position he used to play. But what happened eventually with Pat, he went on to um, go to Harvard Business School and he had a career in finance. Um, but the sequel, sequel I, he, he's, he's, he's doing very well now, but about five years ago, he had a reunion uh, with his uh, platoon or you know, with, with members at, at uh, I don't know at what Marine base it was at. And all was fine at the, uh, at the reunion itself. He had a wonderful time. But when he got back home, uh, he kept finding himself on deserted roads, driving somewhere and bursting and, and, and weeping. And this, was, this is an extremely macho man. And this was extremely upsetting to him. And he didn't know why. And he was eventually diagnosed with PTSD. And uh, his life for a couple of years was in a difficult place. Um, and uh, he, he got some help and he pulled out of it and he's doing very, very well. Um, and uh, he's, he's a wonderful fellow, but that experience that he had in Vietnam, which I could only touch on in this brief excerpt, but was um, in which he acquitted himself so well. He was the head of a, he was led a platoon um, in Vietnam for, for nine months. Uh, uh, but it did come back to haunt him long afterwards. And uh, also his hearing loss was eventually attributed to the nonstop mortar fire for the months that he was at Quezon when the bombing really was sort of almost 24 seven for three months. Mm -hmm. Right, sorry. Did you interview many of the players? Obviously you did, right? Yes, I did. I interviewed about 50 of the players uh, and not all of them, unfortunately, in person. Um, I didn't get out, you know, to the coast and so forth. But uh, um, and I guess part of the reason I wanted to read this tonight, uh, this about this football game is because as I was researching it from, I don't know, 2000. 14 to 2017 or, or thereabouts, um, our country was beginning to start to deal with or all of the issues that in the 60s were being, were, were, had, had come up in the air, were coming back, not that they'd never, it's not that they'd been solved, but were coming back harder and stronger than ever. And in fact, when I interview the players, they'd always say, George, can you believe what's happening? You know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's deja vu. Um, it's just like the 60s. And of course, now everybody makes that same comparison. And when I went on tour to read from this book, people were always asking afterwards, which do you think is worse, 2018 or 1968? Were we more polarized then or are we more polarized now? And in 2018, I said, I don't know. I think it's a toss-up. I wasn't quite so glib, but and now I think we've gone way beyond where we were in, in unfortunately, in 1968. Um, Susan, do you have yeah. ever had writer's block? I mean, you've written so many books. You're writing sequels now. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course I have it. I mean, well, of course. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Um, but. Uh, I had and I had it particularly badly during the um, Trump COVID years um, because uh, you know I was in I was in turmoil um, when George was talking about sixty eight versus uh, twenty eighteen. Uh, I was thinking that that it's it's not quite a repeat. Because the other thing I was disturbed about, I've always been, you know, uh, jumping up and down for um, freedom of expression. And now the left um, is, is telling everyone to shut up. And I was concerned about that too. So I, I really, it really took me time um, to get my bearings, to, to, um, to wake up in the morning and just say, I'm writing a mystery and it's satirical and sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's, you know, horrible things happen, 
but whatever it is, it's, it's what I do for a living. And I really have to go to work because I can't, I can't change anything in the mornings later in the day. I can work on that. So that, that realization plus some, actually some therapy on zoom and good friends and a good family got me back to where I was. But but you, don't miss, it, you don't miss Trump, right? Uh, no, I don't. I do not miss him one, one bit. Um, but, uh, you know, the, um, that those tendencies are still there and that rage is still there. Uh, shortly after Oklahoma, um, the bombing in Oklahoma City, I wrote a book, a novel called Red, White, and Blue, uh, which was about domestic terrorism. And it was relatively early on the internet. And I found so many um, of those uh, homophobic, racist, anti-Semitic websites. And they weren't as sophisticated sophisticated as they are now. They were doing all this uplink stuff and whatever. Uh, but it was it was the same old, same old, and they've they've reemerged much more technically sophisticated, although for their day they were fairly sophisticated. So um, you know I I'm, I'm still involved, but you know, you don't, you don't write what you'd really like to write. Um, well, you write, you write what you can write, what's, what's within. Um, so I'm not Jane Austen, alas, but maybe not alas, because Jane Austen did Jane Austen very well. And all I can do is be Susan Isaacs. Speaking of novelists, Ken, um, how do you come on those all those novelistic details of 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 that guy in the Google meeting? You know, how well, does I, there were like there were like seven people in the meeting uh, with Carmazan and the Google guys. I interviewed all seven of them. And, mm -hmm. and once you have someone with a vivid memory who says, but I remember what happened. Larry said this, or Sergey said this, or Carmazan said that. You then take notes and you ask the other people, do you remember this happening? So you literally cre recreate a scene from the memory of all the people who were right, there. Right, but the, with the shadings on his face, with it's just really uh people have have really good memories and also they do you see these people i mean larry page is someone i've spent time with and i know i didn't read it but but i he doesn't look at you when he talks he looks at the floor mm -hmm. so i could because i had spent time with him i could describe him right right him. and and so it, it's but again it's just reporting it's just you know you you, you i thought that when i heard that anecdote which I heard from Nancy Peretzman, who was Carmazan's uh, investment banker at first, I said, God, that might be a good beginning to crystallize what the book's about, which is disruption between the old and the new, the right. digital world and the two different planets. And and then you have you you keep a note of potential leads or opening chapters. And that one seemed best for me. So you then dig in and you go to all the people and, and report. Well, yeah. Susan, I want to ask you a similar question, which is Ken and I both write nonfiction and you write fiction. How do you create the universe that, you know, the, the, the mini universe that we just heard about um, with all of those details, you know, as richly as Ken does, but with all that reporting, do you report in your brain or do you report? Both. Um, you know, I, I was uh, a journalist in very awkward quotes. Um, I was, I worked at 17 magazine and then 
freelanced uh, a bit. And I was also a uh, freelance political speechwriter for a while in my youth, as uh, they say. Um, so um, I, I can, I do, I know how to research. Um, my husband's also um, a former, um, former assistant U.S. attorney and now a white collar criminal lawyer. So when it comes to law enforcement, either he can give me an answer or he knows somebody or and by now, of course, I know people who can give me the answers. I, I have lunch with cops. I have lunch with FBI agents, CIA, you know, not for these books, but um, a couple of people in the CIA I've, I've spoken to. Um, so it's, it's doing that. It's, um, I like doing research and it's easier, it's easier now, but there's less serendipity than I, I found that when I used to just have to go to the library for a few hours mm -hmm. and suddenly there's a book on the architecture of Connecticut and that became, that led to the house where my main characters lived in almost paradise and informed the whole novel. So um, you, you have to do your homework, but you, as a novelist, you don't want the readers to say, oh, she did so much work. Look at those index cards. <laughs> Pinned on, pinned on to her, uh, her thingy. Um, you, you want it, you want to seem um, authoritative. That the character, of course, is familiar with with her world, and with the See, FBI Susan's, and the NYPD. Essentially, Susan is crystallizing a point that's very common, which is that in both nonfiction, our world, and her world of fiction, reporting is essential to do. But the advantage that a, a novelist has over the reporter is that you get to a door and you say, I can't really talk to this person about motivation, what his, mo his or her motivations were, because they won't talk about it. Susan could go enter that door and create and imagine what that answer is. And knowing the mm -hmm. characters, she gets pretty close to it. So we're stymied as nonfiction writers. We can't. Right, uh, right. And, and I can, and I, listen, I have colleagues, novelist colleagues who, um, you know, there are some who like, uh, in terms of mystery thriller writers, um, like um, Nelson DeMille, uh, who does an enormous amount of research or has someone do some research that he can't, you know, he can't access. But uh, if it's in a different language or something. On the other hand, there's someone like Lawrence Block, who's, I said, how did you, he said, I made it up. And I said, that works. Yeah. It's, it's, it depends. It really does. Ken, I have a, a question for you, um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts too, Susan, on this, which is something that I've been thinking about so much, particularly since the um, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, but it's about in disinformation, misinformation, and for information, and the difficulty we've had in our in our country and, and around the world on agreeing on what is a fact, much less on what is truth. And because you write so much about communication and about these companies that are Part, you know, the, the, where, where facts and you know, people grabbing at truth gets amplified um, a million fold by social media. Uh, I don't expect you to have an answer really because I don't really have a question, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about where we are going with this and how we can get out of it and back to some sense. I wish I knew how to get out of it. I know what the problem is. The, the problem is that there are no, as you suggest, no universal facts. People have their own facts. And 
the digital world allows democratizes, which is wonderful in so many ways. I mean, we see we see from uh, online we see what's happening in Ukraine, which even if you don't have a photographer or reporter there, you're seeing things from citizens who become in effect journalists, and that's wonderful. On the other hand, it democratizes information. Everyone has an opinion, and if they have an opinion, what the online world tends to do is people aggregate with people who have shared the same opinion. So what Senator Moynihan once said, you're entitled to your own opinions, you're not entitled to your own facts. People feel entitled to their own facts. So if you watch Fox News, you get one set of facts. If you watch MSNBC or read the New York Times, you may get another set of facts. So how do you get back to where people are, you know, like a Walter Cronkite's day, you know, people are getting their information from, from single sources. I don't know how to do that in a world where information proliferates the way it has. Yeah. And, but but I know be. that in journalism and, and in democracy, that's one of the core issues we face today. Yeah. It is, and I, just to add to, uh, to what you said, um, there, when I was uh, researching Red, White, and Blue, um, one of the points that the uh, the, the shrinks from Quantico made um, was that uh, the people in these groups uh, listened to the news they wanted to listen to. They read the papers they wanted to listen to. They watched the TV, and of course, that's that's become much more ingrained. So. So who is, is there a Walter Cronkite? There may not be because, you know, um, everybody has, has a universe that they live in and they're, they're very defensive and protective of their beliefs. It doesn't speak well for democracy, um, but maybe with some sort of saturation from from citizens of the world, such as this cell phone journalism, um, there, there there can be some common agreement, some gut reaction to what you're seeing. But part of the pro part of the real problem is a lack of trust. And when you talk about you know how you thought in 2018, maybe 2000, you know 1968. Was, they were comparable, but now in 22, they're no longer comparable. Things are much worse. And one of the reasons they're worse is because of a lack of trust. So you don't have anyone who would have the trust that say Walter Cronkite had today. And if people read the New York Times if, and watch who watch Fox News, they probably will not trust what they read. And they think the reporters, as Trump called us, you know, is, is, are putting out fake news. And how do you deal with that? I mean, it's a huge problem. Sorry to interrupt because you guys are on such a roll, but there's a question out there that I think might be a good follow-up to some of what you're saying. And Nell Painter asked, I'm glad Ken mentioned our post-2020 times because I wanted to ask all three writers if the upheavals of 2016 and 2020, particularly relating to race, changed their thinking and writing. It certainly changed my thinking. I mean, Susan, it was very interesting to hear that you had been somewhat, maybe not immobilized, but, you know, in terms of writing by the events of these last years. Um, uh, I, have, I have felt something like that because I felt, I think particularly as a old white male, um, I really wanted to back away a little bit from writing uh, and to read and listen and figure out before I got back on the keyboard what it was that I thought, what it was that other people thought, even more important. And, 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 and I've, I've been in this period of, of uh, sort of abeyance uh, and, you know, eagerly reading and listening and trying to learn all sorts of things. And uh, so it's, it's, has it changed me? It hasn't changed my writing yet. The only writing I've done have been essays about things that aren't related to the current times at all. Um, but it's, 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 
and it, it hasn't quite paralyzed me, but it's, um, I'm still in the, in a phase that I'm not writing. Let's put it that way. I um, think more about how to communicate and, and particularly not to be glib and, and dismissive and, and full of attitude. Um, how do you communicate to people who maybe don't agree with you? I grew up in Coney Island, which is a working class community. And the people there grew up with a chip on their shoulder, many of them working class people. And many of the people who support Trump have a chip on their shoulder. But they're not all racist. Most of them, I would argue, are, are not racist. And we have to, we, we can't dismiss them. Uh, we have to listen and try and talk to them. And, and I'm not one of them. I didn't vote for Trump and I wouldn't vote for Trump. But um, I don't think the 75 million people who voted for him, all of them are racist, you know, uh, neo-Nazis. And I think there's a tendency in the left to go back, I think to what Susan was suggesting before, to, to make these simple groupings, which is not true. Right, and to want to, to want to shut everybody else up. I've learned an enormous amount in the past uh, couple of years, but most of it has been learning to listen. Um, because I have, you know, strong opinions and they've been, God knows, held for a long time. Um, and about including about my own uh, righteous beliefs. And sometimes I see that I was wrong, misguided. The other thing I, I have always done is have friends who um, differ, um, differ from me. And my um, solution to that with them and I've maintained good relationships is not to discuss what we disagree about because it's a belief. It's like um, someone's, someone's Catholic, someone's um, an evangelical. They're not going to, they're not going to agree, but there are so many other things we can talk about from fiction to cooking to isn't it terrible what's happening to these these poor people you know this is a good place for for us to realize that the unfortunately this episode is going to come down is going to wind down you all have raised so many important things for all of us to think about your discussion has been inspiring and i I have to bring it back to the last two questions that I have for you to wind it down. And I'm sorry to end it because this has been a treat. Uh, the, the next to last question I'm going to ask you is, do you have or do you know of any emerging authors that you think we might have missed that we should know about? So well, I'll tell you, I read an amazing nonfiction book this year by a New York Times reporter who won a Pulitzer Prize some years ago. It, it, her name is Andrea Elliott, and she wrote a book called Invisible Child. It's about a family, a homeless family, and this child who she follows for ten, roughly 10, 10 or so years, and, and the travails they go through. It's just a brilliantly reported um, nonfiction book, and it just, you know, it really gets to your heart. Thank you. I am writing these down. <laughs> I remember reading the excerpt in the in the New York Times uh, magazine. It was absolutely extraordinary. Um, I uh, I've learned so much from watching Write America, and I just want to I just want to uh, say bravo to the three poets who read last week: um, uh, Jamal May, Michelle Whitaker, and Lindsay Atkins. And then I also want to plug a, just a, a marvelous. Um, Nonfiction. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, first novel by uh, Daniel Lodell. It's called Hades Argentina, and that um, full disclosure, he was my editor on the book about the football game. Uh, all the time he was editing my book, he was writing 
a, 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 an extraordinary first novel, which is set in the 1970s in Argentina um, during uh, the Dirty War then. And it's just a sort of haunting, hallucinatory novel. It's well worth reading. Thank you. Um, I would say Oliver Berkman, uh, who was a columnist for The Guardian, ostensibly on time ma management, but he wrote a nonfiction book called 4,000 Weeks, which is essentially a lifetime. And it's, it's, about, it's about living living a full life. It's, uh, there is time management. There's uh, psych great psychology in it. There's stoic philosophy in it. Buddhist philosophy, and he writes like a dream. So I would recommend Oliver Berkman. Thank you. What are each of you reading? That's my final question. Ah, I have the book. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I have it right here. Um, it's called Dryer's English. Oh, it's great. It, yeah, see? There I had go. lunch with Ben Dreyer. Uh, He's a great guy. It is a wonderful book. Good choice. It, it is a delightful book about grammar and usage and style, and it is so funny. So that's what I'm reading and, and, and loving it. It's a great book. Good. I'm reading a, a book by my former editor at The New Yorker, Jeffrey Frank, called The Trials of Harry Truman, which is quite a wonderful book and, and about an everyman Harry Truman and how he came to be who he was and how he performed as in quite extraordinary ways as president of the United States. It's a wonderful book. And I'm, uh, I wish I were reading something else that were, were, it's a very interesting book, but something more apropos of this evening. But uh, after reading Robert Gottlieb's um, uh, piece on uh, Sinclair Lewis a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times Book Review, I read that his favorite novel, Lewis novel was Dodsworth. And that's one that I hadn't read. Oh. And so I immediately got it and read it. And it's wonderful. Oh, um, it is? Really. Yeah. Oh, it really is. Really an extraordinary writer. It, it's, it's just Pretty wonderful. Guy, really. um, so that's what I'm reading. Well, I finished it, just finished it. And you could get a copy, Alice, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I can get a copy of almost anything. But that does remind me that we do have your books in the store, so th or at least the ones that are already out. So. I want to thank each of you. It's been a spectacular evening of sharing your work and conversation. And I hate winding up and I hate taking you off camera and ending the evening, but that it just we're out of time. Um, thank you to Ken and George and Susan for participating in Write America this evening. And to everyone who tuned in tonight, and thank you, thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America. We hope to see you all next Monday at 7 as we welcome Jillian LaRussa and Roger Rosenblatt. Please check out our Birds Books Write America page where you can sign up for upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you all for joining us. Good evening.